Welcome to Timeline Iran. I'm Bob at Calhoun. Join us for this interview with Professor Oliver Bast as we discuss Iran during the constitutional period and World War I. Oliver Bast's research interests include the diplomatic and political history of modern Iran, as well as the interface between historiography, politics, and cultural memory in contemporary Iran. Currently, Bast is finishing a manuscript for a book on Iran's foreign policy and diplomacy versus the great powers during World War I and its immediate aftermath up to 1921. Based extensively on the Iranian archival record, this study challenges the existing narrative by giving a voice to some mostly ignored Iranian protagonists of this key period. We hope you enjoy this program. Please don't forget to like and follow the Timeline Iran podcast. And as always, let us know what you think. Professor Bas, could you please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background for the audience? Yeah, well, thanks very much for inviting me to be on that project. So my name is Oliver Bust, as you uh, mentioned. Uh, I'm here in Paris, but uh, I'm actually German. I uh, came to this field because from a fairly early age onward, I knew I wanted to become a historian. So that led me to sign up for a degree in history at uh, one of the universities uh, in Berlin, uh, Humboldt University, which is the old Berlin University founded in the 19th century uh, and uh, home to great many historians, including, uh, if you like, the founding father of the discipline, uh, Leopold von Ranke, uh, but also people like Mommsen and others. So uh, I went there to study history and then I discovered Persian, Iran and uh, Persian studies. And so I added that to my study of history, gradually uh, developing into a historian of Iran. And for me, it was always clear from the beginning that the history that I'm interested uh, it wouldn't be medieval history or ancient history, it would be uh, modern and contemporary history uh, that had always fascinated me since uh, I had been a child. And so I studied there. I then went on, because I always have been, uh, also since a very early age, a great Francophile. So I uh, made sure I would uh, go and study in France as part and parcel of my degree at that uh, university in Berlin, where I uh, had a great time, where I met great specialists of Iranian studies. First and foremost, uh, Jan Richard, who would become a great mentor for me, a uh, supervisor of my research, and sort of a father figure that I uh, really look up to. But also other uh, great specialists like the late Jean Calmar, the late uh, Roman Oter, each of them also in their own right, uh, uh, great historians of Iran. And I also followed up uh, studying uh, history by attending uh, lectures at uh, the Sorbonne, including uh, the lectures by one of France's greatest specialists of the history of, uh, of international relations history, Georges-Henri Soutou. So I continue to evolve further into uh, a historian with a clear focus now on the uh, contemporary history of uh, Iran, with a particular interest in the history of international relations. And uh, this uh, whole pathway on which I had embarked uh, led me to enroll finally in a doctorate. For that, I went back to Germany uh, to uh, meet up and be, become a student of yet another great historian of Iran and specialist of Iranian studies in a wider uh, sense namely the late Bert Georg Fragner. Uh, professor Fragner was at that time a professor at the University of Bamberg in uh, the south of Germany, even though uh, he himself is not German, uh, but Austrian, and he would later in his career become uh, the director of the Institute for Iranian Studies 
at the uh, Academy of Sciences in Vienna, uh, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, one of the most prestigious institutions dealing in Iranian studies in Europe. In any case, so I went to Fragner and uh, I then uh, embarked on something rather particular, namely a doctorate that would see myself being enrolled in two universities at the same time, namely at the Sorbonne in Paris and at the University of Bamberg uh, in Germany, with having two supervisors, which was of course a wonderful way of profiting from their expertise and they would further guide me and direct me uh, in developing into a, a historian of Iran. This double affiliation gave me a fantastic opportunity for which I'm still uh, incredibly grateful to all the people who, who made that happen. A, a research fellowship, a junior research fellowship if you like, as a doctoral researcher at a French research institution in Tehran, the uh, Institut Français de Recherche uh, en Iran. In Persian, it's known as the Anjumane Iran Chenosia Français d'Iran, which is an institution that uh, is on the one hand linked to the uh, Ministry of Higher Education and Research, and on the other hand to the Foreign Ministry of France. And this allowed me to stay for nearly two years in Tehran in the 90s to carry out my research in various archives uh, uh, such as the uh, National Archive of Iran, Sozimana Asnodemili, uh, in libraries uh, and also uh, closely collaborating with major uh, Iranian historians. This stay gave me the opportunity to become acquainted most notably uh, with uh, Professor Manzure Etahadi and Nezam Mafi of the University of Tehran, with uh, the great uh, independent scholar and historian of Iran, Kaveh Bayat, uh, and other colleagues uh, at the time. Being there uh, at a, a very interesting period in the history of Iran obviously helped uh, further uh, cementing really my uh, decision to uh, become a historian of Iran. Uh, I then ended up, interestingly enough, not in France nor in Germany, but in the United Kingdom, because I uh, was successful in obtaining the position of a lecturer, uh, in American uh, terms this would be an assistant professor, at the University of Manchester, where I worked uh, first at the uh, Middle Eastern Studies Department and later on uh, after promotion to senior lecturer or associate professor at the History Department of that major uh, UK university. Developing my research, uh, uh, having doctoral students doing very interesting work uh, in the field of the modern and contemporary history of Iran. And I also uh, had the great honor of spending one year during my time uh, uh, in Manchester, being on secondment, as it were, on sabbatical, at uh, Yale University's uh, Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies, where I had the great pleasure to work closely with uh, Professor Abbas Amonat of the History Department at Yale, uh, who also uh, guided me further in the development of my research and my outlook on the history of Iran and became a, a great friend and mentor uh, to me during that year. Being in the United Kingdom uh, was a wonderful experience, but when a post for a, a professorship here at the university where I had after all being a student came up, I uh, applied and lo and behold, the honor was given to me to accept me onto that position. And so I moved to Paris about five or six years ago to uh, become a professor at uh, the Sorbonne Nouvelle. Um, uh, what's this, this being the title of that university, which is part of this uh, Sorbonne uh, uh, history uh, that exists uh, and uh, there I am now here in France continuing my work as a historian teaching uh, modern and contemporary Iranian history uh, to undergraduates and master students having uh, doctoral students uh, once more here at uh, my 
uh, institution uh, who are working with me uh, and under my supervision on very exciting uh, topics concerning uh, the history of Iran in the 19th and 20th century. What is the significance of Iran at the moment? Why is your, your studies so important at the moment? Well, uh, I think Iran and uh, the wider uh, Persianate uh, world, if you want to use that term, uh, pertaining to a region where uh, the Persian language and uh, culture uh, and uh, other Iranian languages and related uh, cultures hold sway, uh, is in a, a very important uh, strategic uh, situation for world politics and has always been, uh, interestingly enough, even in ancient times, uh, and this continues to be the case uh, today for a variety of reasons. We see uh, in that region, in particular in Iran, but also in Afghanistan, uh, uh, now a struggle uh, that has arisen uh, between the uh, populations uh, of uh, these countries, which have their own aspirations and hopes and desires, and those who have managed to hold on to executive power uh, in these countries. If you look at Iran, uh, it is clear that there is a struggle between a population that aspires to um, a political system uh, which upholds human rights, democracy uh, and constitutionalism uh, and who find themselves faced with uh, a political system that um, claims to speak in the name uh, of the people and in the name of uh, a religion but is in actual fact to a large degree um, a regime that facilitates uh, the holding on to power and also uh, the getting of economic benefits uh, uh, of a uh, rather small uh, section of people who are in those positions of power and who have created a huge apparatus to basically keep society in check. But this is now being challenged at the time where uh, uh, there is also means and ways for society to organize itself uh, in a way that has not be, uh, existed before, which has also raised an awareness uh, amongst uh, the uh, youth to uh, alternatives to the existing uh, regime and also sort of exchange uh, about values and about the hopes and aspirations of different uh, parts uh, uh, of the Iranian society, be that of another gender, for instance, in this case women, and their uh, struggle, or be that uh, uh, other regions of, of Iran uh, where people might not speak Persian as their mother tongue, uh, but where it has become clear that they all, in the end of the day, uh, are aspiring uh, to a set of principles that are uh, shared uh, regardless of differences about specifics. Uh, and that makes uh, Iran, because you asked that question, extremely special. Because it is a place where this struggle plays out in an area, if we look at it, where most of the neighboring uh, states and countries are not uh, seeing any such struggles going on and where it would seem the same issues exist, the same aspirations and hopes uh, exist, but the uh, people who hold on to power have been able uh, to uh, make sure that none of these aspirations and hopes and uh, demands find a way of being heard. And so if Iran becomes the place where that struggle is successful, this has the possibility of having a profound impact on the whole region and might change uh, the relationship between society and state in quite a few of the other uh, areas and states and territories uh, in that region, which might have 
uh, as a result of this further repercussions at the geostrategic level. So there is a tendency, uh, there has been a tendency of emphasizing uh, Iran's importance because of its uh, resources, uh, namely uh, its oil and gas resources, but also other resources that have still to be developed really to show their true potential in my opinion. Uh, and one cannot uh, deny that these exist and that they have a certain importance. Then a lot of has been made uh, by certain people of the nuclear issue and the need to negotiate uh, with Iran uh, uh, about that. In my opinion, these issues, while important, are not the key issue. The key issue is the issue that I uh, just mentioned. The fact that we see uh, in a Middle Eastern country, which has uh, quite a few specifics, of course, that set it apart uh, uh, from uh, other territories and countries in the region, but also many that it shares, uh, a country in that region uh, is seeing that sort of uprising on the part of society against a, uh, an oppressive state uh, by speaking in the name of universal principles, uh, namely democracy, constitutionalism, the emancipation of women and the, uh, the equality between women and men and gender equality in general terms, because there's a whole lot beyond uh, the mere binary uh, opposition man-woman. Uh, that such a movement there uh, uh, is going on uh, across the country, uniting people from different social backgrounds, from different uh, linguistic backgrounds, from different religious backgrounds, uh, in, in a common struggle that is unheard of. That's unheard of. And that, uh, in my opinion, is the true significance of, of Iran at the present time. And trumps or even dwarfs, in my opinion, the importance that is being given to the nuclear issue and that is given to the richness in resources uh, that Iran has, uh, which hopefully, obviously, will at one point help uh, Iran to attain uh, its true potential. But after all is said and done uh, on that question, my end on this note, uh, the, the most important potential and the most important richness that Iran has are its people, is the Iranians uh, in all their different forms and shapes, if I may say so, be them uh, in Iran or be them uh, for the time being outside of Iran in the Iranian diaspora that is flourishing uh, in a number of uh, uh, countries where they uh, uh, thrive, which is telling, uh, which is telling uh, if we consider the uh, the richness and the wealth that this nation possesses and if harnessed correctly would be able uh, to uh, put to good use as it were. Where would you put the start of the modern Iranian nation? The modern Iranian nation, I mean that is a big concept. There's two major terms in there that would uh, immediately cry out uh, for definition. Uh, namely um, modern, how do you define modernity, and the nation. Now, of course, with all of these things, especially if uh, historians talk, they sometimes do not go uh, to the great length of uh, defining terms as social scientists would do, uh, that are uh, concerned with concepts and notions and that sort of feature of the social sciences that is parsimony, i.e. having uh, the ability to reduce things from the rich nuances that exist in, in reality to models and, and concepts that are universally, be, uh, universally applicable. Uh, but... Uh, uh, if you'd like me to elaborate on Yes, that, please. As far as the modern state of Iran, the, the current state it is, where, where would you put the beginning of that? Yeah, now uh, I, I uh, hear you. I would strongly uh, be uh, in the camp of those who query and question this story of an eternal Iran and the uh, sort of idea that what we have today in the modern nation state of Iran, that it would be possible to draw 
a direct line uh, towards uh, the Achaemenids, say, uh, and uh, to Cyrus the Great. Now, it is true that there are elements, civilizational elements, that go back to that time that uh, uh, continue to play a role in uh, the historical consciousness of Iranians in a way that is not entirely uh, and only uh, a figment of the uh, people's imagination. Because we, of course, uh, have that famous trailblazing study of uh, Anderson on the uh, nations as imagined communities. There is, uh, uh, in the end of the day, a degree of, of imagination in every nation and nation state. There isn't any nation-state, certainly not France or, or Germany, that is somehow a, a given and is, has always been there and is some, some sort of a primordial, has somehow a primordial existence. Uh, and in many respects one could argue that many of the powerful nation-states uh, uh, that exist at the time are, to a degree, more imagined, especially if I look at Germany as a, as a nation, uh, and the German nation, that are more imagined than, than Iran. But having said that, these are sort of fragments and, and, and sort of uh, quasi-archaeologically uh, definable sort of strata. But uh, to draw a direct line and, and to, to, to sort of uh, uh, operate in the name, as it were, of Cyrus the Great might have great sort of folkloric value and, and, and uh, could be uh, uh, entertaining and uh, can be used up to a degree to shore up cultural capital uh, and soft power in the cold hard light of historical research. Uh, one can't maintain the idea of such a direct line because far too many changes have occurred, far too many differences exist between the populations that have been in place at that time and now. So uh, if we look for the roots of the Iranian nation and the Iranian nation-state, uh, even though that has been uh, criticized, uh, this view and people have started to uh, dig holes into this but I would still be with those who maintain that the Safavid period added one element to uh, uh, this mix of criteria that one needs to be able to speak of a nation and a nation state namely territory so there is a sort of a territorial consolidation going on in the Safavid period uh, where a more clearly defined territory uh, uh, that is you know bears some resemblance to what the borders of the uh, Iranian uh, state are today begins to become the center of gravity before that centers of gravity of iranian as if you like, had been at different places a long away for very many uh, centuries, long away from that high plateau uh, uh, and its periphery that makes up uh, the uh, Iranian nation-state of today. Uh, but this beginning to become a center of gravity and also uh, loosening uh, the links with others uh, territories associated with, with that idea of Iran, which had continued to exist to, to a great degree, thanks to the Shahnameh, I would think, uh, the, uh, uh, that center of gravity uh, uh, shifts to a region where it hadn't been for a very long time, if ever. And so there is a territory, I mean, obviously no boundary, even the boundaries of the European states, is natural. There are very few boundaries that are natural. I mean, you might have an island state which has natural boundaries, but the, as soon as you have uh, states that are uh, uh, on the landmass of a continent, 
the, the idea that there are natural boundaries, uh, even if these are mountains, uh, mountain ranges or rivers, is to be queried. Uh, so the boundaries that the Soviet state has or that the Islamic Republic uh, of today has, they are not natural. They are a process of a lot of uh, developments. Uh, but the territorial sort of center of gravity begins to appear there. And interestingly enough, despite the sort of world-conquering attitude of Nader Shah, uh, this association of a particular territory gets uh, reinforced in uh, the uh, not so long reign uh, of Nader Shah. A time also where, interestingly enough, the uh, empires of the region, namely uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire and the uh, uh, Mughal Empire of India, empires that sometimes are also referred to uh, with a reference to theorizations uh, going back uh, quite a while now as the gunpowder empires. Uh, these gunpowder empires uh, begin to recognize uh, the, these territorialities and enter amongst themselves into, which is alien to, to uh, uh, Islamic concepts of international relations that existed before that, if one can speak of something, something like that, they enter into quasi-Westphalian relationships amongst themselves uh, uh, with the uh, remarkable uh, situation that uh, there is a treaty between the, Safavid, uh, between the Persian Empire and the Ottoman Empire regarding the acceptance uh, of a quasi-extraterritorial uh, envoy from Iran uh, from Persia, whatever you want to call it at the time, as the leader of the Hajj for the Shiites. So there is a recognition. This is uh, 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 done between states, between Nader Shah and the Ottoman Empire, uh, concerning something uh, that uh, uh, basically resembles uh, Westphalian international relations between European states. So, uh, this idea of territory becomes uh, the center of gravity shifts towards that high plateau from Central Asia, from Balk, I don't know from where. It, it, it becomes more and more uh, centered uh, in, in that uh, area. And this gets even more uh, enshrined in the Qaja period, uh, where uh, there are also now encounters with the outside powers and the necessity to enter the Westphalian state system full blast, be that uh, as a result of the wars with Russia, where then internationally recognized treaties are being drawn up, which are very unfavorable to Iran, but nevertheless, they, they even in their unfavorableness, give Iran as a territorial state some sort of a seat to sit on in the international system. There are treaties with the Ottomans that follow, uh, Treaty of Erzurum, there are treaties with Britain after the war with Britain, follow of the, uh, uh, the, the Harat, uh, uh, the two Harat crises of the 19th century, which also show this, this hardening of the territory. There's a very interesting book on that question by a colleague of mine, which is called Frontier Fictions, Firoze uh, Karshani Sorbet who studied geography and the notion of space in the uh, nascence of this Iranian nation-state. And so that territoriality comes into being. And when then uh, is the other element coming into it, namely the consciousness of belonging to a nation, that element of the imagined community, that is developing, uh, in my opinion, from uh, the reign of uh, Nasser Adin Shah onward, uh, where this territoriality, with all the questioning that is still going on, I mean, Harad is not easily given up. The, 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 the Transcaucasian territories are not easily given up. The areas of the Makran, which is now Baluchistan, are not easily uh, given up. And there is a concept uh, uh, still at the, uh, in the Qajar period that somehow the Amir of Bukhara uh, which is by that 
time uh, developing into an independent country, even though under the tutelage of Russia very quickly, is somehow a vassal of the of the Qajar uh, Shah and is addressed in that way. Uh, while this imperial thinking is still there, we are moving uh, to a reality that is not really imperial anymore, which is linked to a concrete territory uh, as a nation state. The tensions between these two concepts, of course, continue to inform politicians uh, and foreign policymakers in that period. But uh, there is that. Now, where comes the consciousness? Well, the consciousness comes with uh, uh, the struggle that arises for government that holds the uh, absolute power of the monarch to a degree of responsibility. This is, of course, the uh, longish struggle for uh, 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 the establishment of a constitutional monarch, which uh, is now uh, bringing another element to this, to this idea of the nation. I mean, the people are continuously, I suppose, proto-nationalists from the time of Nasruddin Shah onwards, in the sense that they are now happy to work with that territory and to advance also in the international stage with that particular territory in mind. But now comes a dimension that is linked to a political system that gives a greater degree of participation and uh, uh, gives a, uh, a more rational organization of government away from a, 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 an absolutism where all the power through two different ways of legitimization uh, one older, we're harking back to uh, the uh, ancient period, one younger, harking back to the Safavid period, while uh, this, this, this absolute power base, you know, uh, resting on these two pillars of legitimization is now being challenged by society, interestingly enough. And uh, there comes uh, the question of modern ways of organizing government. And this is in that struggle, in my opinion, even this is not something very original, very new, but I hold on to that uh, because it seems uh, sensible to do so. It's in that struggle that some sort of a national consciousness arises, uh, which is uh, early on, uh, interestingly enough, comparable to the national consciousness or the consciousness that is uh, inspiring the uprising that is going on at the moment, namely adherence to a number of universal values, uh, uh, constitutionalism, liberal democracy, whatever the people at the time might have understood of it. Uh, and there have been various studies that have shown that there, many people had no idea uh, uh, what they were talking about when they s were shouting for these things in the streets. Uh, animated by leaders. And it is also clear that uh, in that constitutional struggle participated many group uh, uh, or sector, uh, be that tribal leaders, be that uh, ulema, be that uh, uh, merchants, be that religious leaders also of minorities, who had a totally different agenda, uh, who were not beholden to these ideals. Uh, but in any case, it so happened and it uh, uh, began to give a national consciousness, but which was an interesting national consciousness, in my opinion, which then became a, a, a little bit narrowed down, uh, which was all-encompassing, which had no very narrow sort of ethnic uh, view, which was more a consciousness that, that, that was subscribed, well, on the one hand, obviously, to that territory that had been already established on the one hand, and a sort of approach to a, a form of government and a form of, you know, coexisting together in structures of organization, which was not linked to any particular ethnic group. And that's why you have also, uh, you know, these statements of major leaders uh, that participated in the revolution that didn't necessarily have Persian as their mother tongue, that were not Shia Muslims, uh, like the Armenian uh, participants. There's a great book by a colleague exercising in the States, which is a quote, of course, the title, The love of freedom has no fatherland.
you know, this is the spirit of that nation at that time. This uh, evolves later under the influence of various European concepts of ethno-nationalism uh, into something more narrow, which uh, does harm to uh, people who do not recognize themselves in that. But the beginning is in that struggle for accountability, for uh, new forms of government and uh, new ways of living together that takes place in the 19th century and that finds one first major culmination, obviously, in the achievement of a constitution uh, in 1906. It's very important not to romanticize this struggle as it's sometimes done and to be aware of all the many, many nuances. But if we want to find uh, the roots of the uh, modern Iranian nation, uh, I think we still have to go there. And so I suppose it's clear there's the territorial issue and then there's the, the issue of a, of a national consciousness that, uh, that both of them develop uh, uh, at different stages and sometimes then become, of course, intertwined. Take us through steps to the, the Qajars, uh, the constitutional movement, explain to us what situation exists. We would have to go back into the 19th century, obviously, to uh, look at a few features that, that bring about the situation that Iran finds itself in, if we take the outbreak of the First World War, uh, i.e. the summer of 1914, as our starting point, uh, we then have to probably uh, uh, move on a little bit further. The starting point for the First World War in the Middle East, where it also uh, concerns Iran, is obviously not necessarily the 1st of August uh, 1914, when war is declared in Europe, but the entry of the Ottoman Empire into the First World War uh, that becomes manifest only in October 1914 and then begins to be something that concerns Iran massively. So if we go back from that October uh, 1914 to understand how Iran has become the Iran that it is in that time, well, yeah, we, we need to look uh, uh, at developments on the international relations side and we need to look at developments at the uh, domestic politics. In the 19th century, as I already hinted at, the Iranians found themselves, or, or Iran, that territory that is nowadays Iran, found itself under a new dynasty uh, uh, that had emerged in a power struggle that uh, had consumed Iran in the second half of the 18th century uh, between different centers of power in the wake, if you like, of the assassination of Nader Shah. This hardening of the territory uh, frontiers goes on through losses mainly, namely the loss of the Transcaucasian territories in two wars with Russia that end in both cases humiliatingly, and in a war with Britain over the question of Herat, which was considered as naturally appertaining to uh, uh, this center of gravity in the high plateau. So the fact that Herat is in Afghanistan is not in any form or shape something that is utterly natural, you know, but it came about uh, as a result of geopolitical situation, the rise of Afghanistan as a, or as a territorial state supported by Britain at that time in the context of ever increasing rivalry with Russia in the region between Britain and Russia, that uh, region that contains also Iran, due to uh, Russian expansion in uh, the course of the 19th century to the Asiatic uh, territories into Central Asia, partly because expansion uh, uh, to the West had been barred as a result of the, uh, of the Crimean War in the middle of the century and Rush in British fears for their jewel in the crown, namely the Indian colony. That rivalry becomes, throughout the 19th century, ever stronger and is one of the, uh, the constituents of the, of the foreign policy situation that Iran finds itself in, in uh, the 19th century, which has advantages and disadvantages for Iran, because Iran, under the Qajars, is able to a degree to benefit from that rivalry and to exploit it because it very quickly a situation ensues where 
these two big major players in that region, Britain and Russia, do not want that the other gets control of the whole of Iran for their own reasons. And this gives Iran at an international level after the, say on from the middle of the 19th century, some breathing space, some room for maneuver by cleverly and carefully trying to exploit that antagonism between the two great powers while also having to contend with the still powerful Ottoman Empire uh, to its west and the rising territorial state of Afghanistan to the east. In that situation, we see this rivalry, which has disadvantages. Also means that a lot of investment, for instance, for railway building and the infrastructure development, more generally speaking, is not happening because each time any attempt is made in that direction by one of these great players, the others make such a fuss uh, that finally the uh, idea is left to one side and the project is not really pursued because neither side is willing to go uh, into war over this, even though at some stages they come very close. This international situation uh, then is accompanied nevertheless by an increased period of economic penetration in uh, the late 19th century, where the Iranian state, which is also developing at the same time, uh, in that center of gravity that it has now found, and uh, wants to modernize at least moderately, but has needs on a financial uh, basis to do that. Given that there is a ma massive financial indigence, uh, the idea arises that one could bring money into the coffers of the state through the selling of concessions. And that brings into the country increasing uh, economic penetration, mainly by firms from these two major players who are eagerly regarding what the other does and are competing. You have a British bank, which becomes in actual fact the bank that takes care of the Iranian banknotes, the Imperial Bank of Persia. The Russians have their own bank, which becomes extremely successful in implementing itself in the north of the country by uh, being able to strike excellent relationships with local, well-embedded, proto-bank type financiers and sarafis and the like, and aid Russian business to penetrate the north of Iran, much to the chagrin of the British, whose bank uh, doesn't celebrate such great successes, uh, lacking uh, that uh, level of very strong embeddedness with the local business community, but operates nevertheless. That situation obviously brings only temporary relief because the concession can be sold only once. One of such a concession in actual fact, of course, as you uh, know, uh, is the tobacco concession of the early 90s of the 19th century, which for a variety of reasons creates such a bad impression that there is a, a, a national outcry against it, which for the first time brings about a situation where this absolutely uh, ruling monarch is forced to cave into society. What has been underlined is that the, uh, a major factor in that response has been the existence of the telegraph, which allowed different regional centers of resistance against this concession coming to the scene for different reasons. Some of those reasons fully and uh, utterly unrelated to the actual concession, which in and of itself isn't uh, neither here nor there in a way. But it brought these different centers of discontent together and allowed to bring about a degree of scale to the resistance, which scared the monarchy. And here there's a parallel, you know, I mean, the telegraph of those days is the Instagram of today. Be that as it may, uh, the, the economic uh, penetration uh, continues apace and at the moment when you don't have anything to sell anymore, well you 
begin to take out loans and that is what the Karja state did. Through those loans they became even more beholden obviously to the foreign powers that were behind these loans. Yet of course uh, the whole uh, loan business still offered a degree of maneuverability and room for maneuver because both big players were willing to give loans and they were competing over it as well. Uh, but with the loans came stipulations about what to do and not to do in terms of economic development because it wasn't in the interest of Russia, for instance, that there would be uh, Iranian railway building in uh, bringing in other powers. So the idea that one could perhaps turn to a third power, like the emerging Germany, which came about of the 1871 unification or Austria or, 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 or even in theory at least the United States even they are still very long and not interested. That idea is not really um, something that can be easily pursued because there is this ever fastening grip of these two other powers who don't want anybody else in there. This culminates a further concession which will have a long-term impact that is uh, obtained by a British subject in 1901, the Darcy Oil Concession, which uh, in the first instance seems rather unimportant because there is no oil, so it's, it's, it's speculative. And a lot of activity goes on to find it and they are obviously, uh, well not obviously not, but they are in actual fact on the brink of abandoning this project in 1908 when they finally struck oil. But even then we have to be very careful not to overestimate this. It's just one of many concessions because A, at that time that oil is rather useless because it can't be used for what oil is used at the time, namely lamp. So it's not a huge deal. It acquires an importance only when we come to this actual First World War in a second. So, in that context, now of uh, increasing foreign sort of penetration, which is only mitigated by a degree of exploiting the rivalry of that penetration by two major powers that in the end of the day keep themselves to a certain degree in check. In that situation occurs, partially linked of course to the experience of, of helplessness, in the face of this something which is increasingly being resented by uh, uh, educated people as, a, as foreign domination but also related to other things erupts the constitutional revolution which you know is filled by these inspired by these ambitions and aspirations that we spoke about uh, and is successful in the first instance at least insofar as it gets Iran a constitution and uh, uh, ushers Iran into the constitutional era. This occurs and this is something that is uh, increasingly considered as uh, an issue by the Russians who fear that uh, this new constitutional government might be less pliable and less uh, willing to witness the deep economic penetration uh, that is going on, helped by the ingenuity of, of a number of business people also on the Iranian side and their Russian partners. And Russian might not necessarily be uh, ethnic Russian, it might be Azerbaijani or uh, Central Asia uh, or Tatar. It often helps to be from a background like that to do business in those uh, areas coming from a, uh, from a Russian perspective. Rather successful activities of the bank, of course, that support it, uh, which is also headed by rather well-appointed uh, and, and, and able managers. That is something that in Russia is not considered to be something that one wants to give up easily, and also because there's always the fear that behind this might be British influence and British ends. So very quickly there is a strong enmity that is developing uh, towards this regime on the part uh, of the Russians, while there is also only lukewarm support from a political establishment in Britain that should theoretically be taken into consideration that we have a shift to the Liberal Party be welcomed. But for the same reasons in a way uh, that exists for the Russians, namely the fear of a lack of being able to influence things, there is at the government level, I'm not speaking about individuals that on the ground have actually been quite 
helpful in opening up, the, for instance, the embassy of Britain for the famous revolutionary busts and so on. Speaking about what's going on in London, uh, there is a certain, there's, there's only lukewarm support at best, but in the end of the day, it's a, it's, a, it's a geographical embarrassment. So this happens at that time. The rivalry is still big, and then developments at the uh, international scene bring about reducing of these tensions between Russia and Britain because these two powers that get close to a proxy war between themselves in 1905 over the war between Japan and Russia, with Japan being a country that has in actual fact an alliance with Britain, even though it doesn't come to the case of alliance because they are the attacker in the, in the context of the 1905-1904-5 Russo-Japanese war. So while these two countries come, as it were, to a proxy war, this serves somehow as a wake-up call as well. Because now there are geopolitical considerations in Europe, on the continent, that begin to preoccupy these two powers beyond their Asiatic rivalry. And that's the rise of the German Empire and the ambition under post-Bismarckian German Empire to pursue world politics and to become a major player at the world stage, the fleet-building program that goes with it, the very, very bellicose rhetoric and the desire to acquire colonies or at least have the open door where areas are not yet colonized, including by a few enthusiasts, although nobody takes them very seriously at the helm of the German leadership concerning ideas to become active in Iran. This begins to worry and this is beginning to upsetting the uh, uh, European power equilibrium and this not least helped also by the French who had become an ally of Russia in the uh, 90s of the 19th century brings about a rapprochement to a certain degree between Russia and Britain to uh, at least have some sort of an understanding over who does what in the Asiatic area, so as to not a coming into a situation where these tensions and that rivalry might erupt into military conflict between the two of us, which will then be exploited by a laughing third, namely Germany. And out of this is born the infamous 1907 Anglo-Russian Convention which is a, uh, an arrangement to stay out of each other's hair in that area of fierce competition, namely Persia, Afghanistan and Tibet. So a whole area in Asia creating a, a sort of buffer between the British Indian Empire and the Russian uh, Empire, which has been expanding deep into Central Asia and which has also been very successful in economically penetrating Persia and where Afghanistan is sort of to be declared to be off limits by the two of them. So to stay out of each other's hair as it were with the hope that this would not then present uh, an opportunity for the Germans to exploit uh, forever that sort of antagonism. And it is true. German foreign policy at the turn of the century was guided by the idea that one would have free hand. We have, will always have the Russian bear and the British veil and be, they will always be at each at odds with each other and that gives us a free hand as some of the German politicians at the time would put it. That free hand is no longer no there. For Persia it also means that this rivalry now no longer can't be exploited. Now you have these two major neighbors coordinating their policies. So whatever lukewarm support the British might have had, especially the liberal government that comes later into power for the constitutional revolution, is now completely overshadowed by, a, by what? By geostrategic considerations. The, not alliance, but understanding with Russia, which basically means that the Russians are allowed to do as they please in the north, the British are allowed to do as they please in an area that is sort of adjacent to British India, and there is a zone in the middle to basically assure that sort of buffer situation. And so the penetration continues. It has an impact on the constitutional revolution because with the, the death of the monarch that signed the constitution and the arrival of the throne of um, Muhammad Ali Shah Qajar, who uh, 
manages to secure Russian support for his enmity towards this idea of the constitution and the reducing of the absolute power of the monarch, counter-revolution ensues, strongly welcomed by Russia and not opposed uh, by Britain. One can now think about why this happened and, and what Muhammad Ali Shah Rajah's motives were. It's a period that then brings a, a civil war, as we all know, and there is a period of uh, a second victory for the constitutional movement, forcing this monarch who had taken on uh, the constitutional regime into exile. But that new uh, constitutional phase that begins in 1909, after a brief period of a return, if you like, to absolutism, even though, it, strictly speaking, Muhammad Ali Shah Rajah never abolished the constitution between June 1908 and July 1909, so the, big, the area, that, that the era that begins in July 1909, has now to contend with that new geostrategic situation. There is hope by the constitutional regime to interest Germany after all, which has now also become clear that it is in an open rivalry with these two others and can't no longer also sort of play the approach and the card of the free hand. And there are some glimmers of hope at some time that the Germans might be interested, but finally nothing comes of it. Most importantly, because the Germans even, in a way, become a sleeping partner in this division of Iran, because they sign an agreement with Russia in 1910, it is being prepared and then it is endorsed in 1911, the so-called Potsdam Agreement, which makes uh, Germany declaring that it will not seek any economic interests in Iran and it will fully recognize Russian preponderance in the north of Iran, in that zone defined by the 1907 convention, in return for Russia not uh, taking issue with the uh, Baghdad railway project that uh, is being pursued by German industry in co cooperation with the Ottomans and perhaps even to get involved in it financially. Even that brief idea that one might now, given that the two big players that one could always play off one against the others are now coordinating themselves, one could bring in a third power. This is also now dead, at least by 1911. And then a second time, the uh, measures being taken by the constitutional government to sort of embark on a project of modernization and to bring about measures to strengthen central government, including the idea of creating revenue by taxing huge uh, landowners uh, with the help of a treasury chief that had been hired from abroad in the form of the American citizen Morgan Schuster, incurs the wrath of the Russians once more who now, of course, in a much better position to take this challenge on because they do not have to fear that the British would somehow exploit this because there is this understanding in place. And it, in actual fact, by 1911, the outlook of somehow the existence of a bloc containing Russia, Britain and France and Germany and Austria, on the other hand, has sort of become more and more uh, visible, even though we are not yet at uh, the situation of the First World War. In any case, at that moment in time, there is basically a Russian pressure which forces the Iranian government to abolish parliament and to cave in to Russian demands concerning the uh, chief of the treasury to prevent a wholesale invasion of Iran by Russian troops, which could have ended Iranian territorial integrity. So it's a hard call to make and one has, in my opinion, to study more that moment in time where conventional wisdom is quick at condemning the political elites that take the decision to cave in to Russia. But would resistance at that moment in time be in the right choice? That's the question. Maybe not. This is one of those uh, points, you know, that you refer to as well, and where it, politicians take decisions that cannot be addressed uh, with the with some sort of a general moral compass, you know, that require. 
to be looked at with the complete knowledge of the context in a, a fair assessment of the potential alternatives. In any case, it, it, this second constitutional period now it comes to an end while the economic penetration, especially of the North, by the very efficient Russians that I uh, had hinted several times at, continues unabatedly. And on the political level, Iran sort of seems to be sinking into some sort of a political slumber where we have governments that are constitutional, of course, but not at all in any form or shape controlled by a sitting parliament where the economic penetration continues and very little, if any, progress is being made with the modernization agenda that, after all, had informed the constitutional revolution. Namely, you know, to exactly do that now, to build that nation state, get a, a grip on the finances, to establish a strong central government that would be able to make its uh, power felt in the whole of the territory, to develop the infrastructure, to bring revenue, uh, to pursue education and economic development. None of these noble aims could be really very successfully pursued in that period, just in the run-up to the First World War. There is, however, a shred of hope just as the world ushers into the crisis that will finally set off the First World War. And that's where we are now. Iran, after this period of constitutional slumber from 1911 onward, begins to organize elections for a new parliament in the spring of 1914. And then there is another element uh, that gives a certain degree of hope at the sort of symbolical political level. After the Shah, that uh, monarch that had taken issue with the constitution, Muhammad Ali Shah Rajah had been forced in to abdicate, his next in line is too young to take the throne. So for a period of time, the country had regents. Finally, in the summer, just while the July crisis erupts, basically, uh, very quickly in, in, in Europe, with the assassination of the crown prince, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, just shortly before it comes to this, in Iran, uh, there are celebrations to mark the uh, ascending to the throne of this young next in line to Muhammad Ali Shah Rajah, Sultan Ahmad Shah Rajah, who is finally crowned as a monarch, who seems to embody also a sort of a point of departure where now finally maybe one would be able to get on with that nation building uh, process in a constitutional context knowing obviously that it won't be easy, given that uh, there is this geopolitical uh, situation. And then the First World War erupts in the summer. This seems far, and it is something that is obviously viewed with great interest, because it uh, is a war that might have the potential to weaken Russia, who still has troops being placed in Iran, going back to the period of the civil war against the moving away from constitutionalism that occurred in 1908-9 under Muhammad Ali Shah Rajah. So there are the troops of a belligerent country on the territory. But there is hope that they might have to be removed maybe because they will be needed on the Western Front. And uh, the Iranians don't seem overly worried, it would appear. But then the war arrives in the Middle East because perhaps unexpectedly to the uh, Iranians and unexpectedly to others, uh, even though to a certain degree the writing, one could argue, had been on the war, the Ottoman Empire decided to enter the First World War uh, on uh, the side of the Central Powers. And Iran has now belligerent power next door fighting with another belligerent power which is also next door while this belligerent power has troops on its territory. So it becomes a massive problem which forces in the first instance the Iranian government to take a stance and declare neutrality on the 1st of November 1914. 
making it known to all and sundry through its networks of embassies it after all had, so we would have what I have to say, legations in the world that uh, Iran is not taking the side of any of the belligerent powers. Uh, the war has arrived in a country which has made very little progress in terms of modernization and becoming a modern nation state. There is a certain territory that is associated with it, but it is being encroached upon. There is a national consciousness that has arisen and there is a desire to undertake measures. But uh, whenever an attempt had been made to get some business done, as it were, in inverted commas, interventions have occurred to a strong degree linked to foreign power intervention, which has stopped that in their, in their tracks. Now the war erupts. What might it bring? What might it allow to do, what dangers also are associated with it. For the Iranians, of course, uh, that are politically conscious and foreign policy makers that look upon this situation, it's a situation that is fraught with danger, but also containing opportunities. Explain to us what is the reality of the situation? What is the death toll? Why was it just so many unsuccessful governments coming? Again, I've had people compare Iran to a failed state at that time, very little control. Take us through that period. I mean, explain it to us. There are different phases, of course, uh, for Iran as it uh, goes through its own First World War. We have arrived at that beginning that I just tried to sketch out with a, you know, a, a constitutional state, yes, but very weak, having been you know, the subject also of economic penetration by foreign powers, namely Russia and the North, hanging over it an agreement, a convention between Russia and Britain, where it was never ever asked, of course, what it thought about it, where its territory, even though still nominally independent, is being divided up into zones over its head. But it's still uh, there. It is still an independent monarchical constitutional state that has a shred of international legitimacy, not least because uh, and I didn't dwell on that before, the uh, various Iranian governments, whatever their outlook might have been uh, from the end of the 19th century onwards, have always made sure that they hang on to every little shred of international legitimacy that they can acquire. So the, Iran is one of the early signature countries of what is the organization of the Red Cross. Iran part took in the famous Hark peace conferences that the Russian Tsar initiated in 1899 and in 1907, sending a brilliant delegate there to make a case for Iran, which became in actual fact the darling of the international peace set uh, and failed to get the Nobel Peace Prize one of the very first Nobel Peace Prizes, namely Mirza Reza Khan Arfao Dole, who was Iranian's delegate at these conferences and performed, as I have argued, on the world stage, the sovereignty of what was to all intents and purposes, as you put it, a failing state. But the fiction of being an international state perfectly in the same vein as Chile or Switzerland was maintained and not without a certain degree of success. And that helped the foreign policymakers at the time to latch onto and to hang on to the idea that one has to go through that war and intentionally obtain a better position even though the sort of democracy was hanging over their heads of partition. So in those early days of the war, where we see this, you know, small hopes with elections being taking place, with the new parliament actually coming together, the third majlis, the third parliament of the uh, constitutional period being finally formed in 1914, 15. Uh, while all of this is going on, uh, of course, the war is raging on. There are battles raging on Iranian territory from the end of 1914 through advanced groups, irregular units of the Ottoman army that take on the Russians that are on the ground in Persian Azerbaijan. So at that stage, uh, however, the war is not affecting 
massively the civilian population. And uh, these are areas uh, that are limited where this is playing out. Iran has an importance now, as you quite rightly pointed out, from strategic point of view for Britain, that goes beyond all of that what has been already said, namely the protection of India. Namely, because oil is beginning to be considered as something important. As you hinted at, because in a very narrow sort of decided struggle, uh, the decision is being made to uh, switch the uh, propulsion of the British Navy from coal to oil. And the issue of having a steady supply of fuel is something that requires a strategic importance and is in actual fact the reason that saves the company that preceded the Anglo-Persian oil company because oil is struck as I said in 1908 then in 1909 a company is formed but it is on the brink of collapse because their oil is basically not of any interest to anybody because it's too heavy to be used for lamps and they struggle selling it. Now, uh, because through refinery processes it can be used for that purpose that is the propulsion of the fleet, the British state decides to become a major stakeholder in that company because there is a fear that otherwise one would become the victim of price fluctuality and potentially also be basically in a situation where the major oil companies of the day, which are all American, could somehow hold Britain to ransom over their needs for oil. So the idea is we need to have our own access, or at least we need to have something where we can also bargain with these American companies. And that's why Britain gets involved. One important point has to be made, however. While this is something done with a strategic vision, and Winston Churchill is a key figure here when this is being decided, it's not having an immediate impact because the changing of the fuel takes a lot of time and only is actually something that is really important at the end of the war. And most of the politicians that influence Britain's policy uh, towards Iran are still in the mindset of imperial concerns, which is first and foremost the security of India. And everything passes through that prism. And oil is a minor issue. It can sometimes be used perhaps even to build it up. But uh, the interest in Persia, especially by a figure that would become on the British side ever more and more and more important, namely uh, Lord Curzon, is entirely informed by strategic imperialist concerns to do with the protection of India and not with uh, the richness in wealth in oil that exists in Iran. But it is there, it is an issue. These installations have been developed. They become, of course, the target in the context of the First World War. By whom? Well, quite naturally uh, in the sinking, at least by the Ottomans. But what is happening in Iran in the early stages of the, far, uh, of the First World War is something which I have called the German moment. Because through a a variety of events and factors and constellations, there is a increased presence of German agents in the country from 1915 onward. And this is to do with the interest that is taken by both German diplomacy and German military leadership in uh, the Muslims of India in particular and in generally the Muslim populations of the Russian and the British Empire, uh, not least because there is now this alliance with the Ottoman Empire, which is obviously a, a Muslim country which has at its head the person who is nominally at least the caliph, uh, namely the Ottoman Sultan. And people are beginning to be heard in Berlin that argue we should revolutionize the Muslims of the British and the Russian empires against them uh, in the name of jihad, 
if possible, if not in the name of just anti-colonialism and nationalism, and if that would force the Russians and the British to divert resources to those theatres. And as a result of this, the idea is being seriously undertaken by German military leaders and diplomatic leaders to convince the Emir of Afghanistan, Habibullah Khan, to join the war and to lead an attack on in British India. And the representatives of Germany that are bound to reach Afghanistan have to go via Iran. And while they are in Iran, they encounter a situation where they are welcomed with open arms and supported by local nationalists, which is mainly, you know, people associated with the constitutional struggle from a couple of years uh, ago, who are seeing the situation of World War I as one where one should side and exploit the, the might of the central powers, and especially Germany, to shake off that Russian and British penetration and domination. And when these agents on the ground, and also some very optimistic reporting from the German legation in Tehran, reaches the ears of the decision makers in Berlin, they finally come to the conclusion, even though they didn't want to hear about it early on, that maybe, just maybe, one might not only be able to get Afghanistan into this, but also revolutionize Iran. And negotiations start in that direction. And the Iranians interested in playing the German card are obviously talking up their ability to play such a role. And they point to an interesting situation, namely that one of the two small military forces that Iran at that time has, which has no army to speak of, uh, because the efforts of creating a modern uniform army uh, have never, you know, uh, really uh, gotten anywhere. Not before the Constitutional Revolution, when these efforts were made of modernization by various uh, monarchs, uh, nor after it. But there is a small Swedish officer gendarmery, and the Swedish officers themselves, in the great majority in any case of these units, are pro-German in the war that uh, is going on. Indeed, Sweden as a state remains neutral, but only by the skin of its teeth. There was a strong pro-German faction in Swedish decision-makers uh, who might have, if they had been successful, taken Sweden into the First World War. Uh, but finally, the country as such remains neutral, which is of course a wise decision at the time. But these officers on the ground are very much anti-Russian and anti-British, let's put it that way and therefore open to these suggestions that they might become the nucleus of a military force of an Iran that would side with the Germans. And there are indicators that go into that direction because a group of former participants in the constitutional struggle, most notably Seyed Hassan Tarizadeh, wash up in Berlin where they cooperate with the, the German Foreign Office in the creation of a coordinating uh, group for these activities. The famous Nachrichtenstelle für den Orient, the uh, communications office or uh, intelligence office, if you like, for uh, the Middle East. Then uh, there are individual German agents that know Iran from a previous diplomatic or scholarly activity that arrive on the ground in their areas of uh, knowledge uh, and foment public opinion and link up with various community leaders, tribal leaders, to and create a, a momentum which takes on British and Russian interests in Iran. One such individual is a certain Wilhelm Wasmus, who uh, had been previously uh, a diplomat on the Persian Gulf Coast in Bushehr, and manages to gain that area again, and is basically creating a, a, a movement 
which forces the British in the May of 1915 to land a expeditionary corps to secure the port of Bouchehre. But that's what they secure. Beyond it is a no-go area for the British, provoked by the activities of this Vasmus in cooperation with leaders of the uh, various populations settling there, the Tangistanis in particular, and leaders like Zeyar Khesa Khan and Rais um, Ali Delwari. So the whole country by the middle of 1915 is inflamed with movements which often have resulted in being the British and the Russian diplomatic representatives to flee the towns where they were based, like Isfahan, uh, or Hamedan, or Kermanshaw, or even being arrested, as uh, it happens in Shiraz, with the uh, British consul O'Connor, which is then transferred to the fort uh, of Zeyr Khesa Khan and the hinterland of Bouchehre. So while these Germans in the first place had arrived with the idea we need to go to Iran quickly to arrive in Afghanistan. Now Iran becomes a, a center of upheaval and uprising and politicians that see themselves in the tradition of the constitutional movement and others begin to entertain the, uh, the idea of actively forming a, uh, an alliance with the German Empire and enter activities in Tehran, as you hinted at, are getting completely out of hand. One government follows the other. There is a run of the Imperial Bank of Persia that the Germans initiate, which brings to its knees the uh, financial power of the B B British Bank in Tehran. The return of the German minister uh, in the spring of 1915 becomes a triumph for anti-entente feelings. In the midst of all of this, there are still de uh, parliamentary debates where deputies of the various groupings that are very anti-British and anti-Russian also use the tribune of the parliament to uh, attack politicians and uh, cabinets that they believe to be pro-entente. And all of this sort of comes to a... There, there's a long financial cabinet crisis in the summer of 1915 where there's basically nobody able to form a government. And in the midst of all of this upheaval, there is finally a culmination in the autumn of 1915 when plans are now really being put towards an implementation of that alliance between politicians. Uh, there is a cabinet in place led by Mostofi Ol Mamolek, who is known for his constitutional credentials and is also somebody who has lived and studied in Germany and is uh, considered as pro-German. The plans are basically going into the direction of, well, we shift the government and the monarch, the Shah, to Isfahan and make Isfahan uh, temporarily the capital of a movement of resistance against Britain and Russia with the help of Germany and the help of the Ottoman Empire and with the creation of a uh, military movement where the nucleus of it is the Swedish gendarmerie units, the Swedish officer gendarmerie unit that are uh, in place. There are plans afoot as well that has, have been put together by the German a military attaché who had traveled extensively to the west of Iran, making contact with all manner of tribal groups, including the Kal Horse and the Wali of Poshtuku and the Laws, and also a, a politician of the area, Nezamu Zaltane, with the idea that they would be able to form a strong uh, unit of tribal fighters that would partake in that whole uprising. The only problem is that the preparations of all of this were not very secret and British and Russian and uh, also French representatives in the capital were fully aware and monitoring these, these activities and the French minister whose attitudes and reports I have studied in particular never ceases to call for action and is also of the opinion that his Entente allied colleagues, the French and the Russian representatives, 
uh, the, the Russian and the British representative are not doing enough to counter that threat, partly because they are still busy to cultivate their old rivalry, because these are veterans of the old antagonism and don't get on particularly well. But finally, also helped by the uh, French minister who tries to coordinate the response and tries to ring the bell of alarm, the Allied governments take note and they set the Russian forces that are already in the country anyway into a state of alarm and threaten to march on Tehran. This news creates havoc on the 15th of November 1915 in Tehran because before all of these plans for a formal and orderly retreat to Isfahan could have been executed, there is now the danger that the Russian army will take Tehran or what passes for the Russian army which is Cossack units stationed in Razvin. And the tenors of anti-Russian activity, anti-British activity, pro-German activity, including the representatives of Germany, Austria and the Ottoman Empire, flee in a rather uncoordinated way the capital. But they believe that everything is ready. Alliance treaty is ready to be signed by the government of Mostafi al-Mamolek. The orders are being given to the foreign representatives of different countries to make their way to Isfahan, the new capital. The car of the Shah is waiting downstairs from the palace with a unit of gendarmes that are there to basically accompany the Shah and escort the Shah down to Isfahan. But everybody has left. The Shah remains. And this is of great symbolic value for the movement. The Shah had been convinced finally by members of his family, especially his uncle, Noyabu Saltane, to stay in Tehran uh, uh, with the promise that if he did so, the Russians would refrain from taking the cup. With the warning that if he went with the pro German nationalist lot, he might lose his throne and the Russians might in actual fact bring back his father from his exile. So uh, the Shah is uh, intimidated and uh, perhaps also makes uh, some calculations which are not entirely unrealistic and uh, decides to stay. And this is already the first defeat of that sort of movement, which then interestingly enough is being mopped up relatively quickly when the Russians bring in a regular army unit and make these representatives uh, move. First they go down to Qom. From Qom then they go west to be in Hamedan and then in Kermanshah and then finally uh, they are driven out of Iranian territory and wash up in Baghdad and finally in Istanbul under the umbrella of the Ottomans, of course. And this German moment, uh, which seemed so sort of uh, bringing the country so close to entering the First World War uh, evaporates. Uh, there is a British response as well, which is the creation of a military unit out of Bandara Abbas, where an officer of the Indian Army, promoted specifically for that purpose, Major General uh, Sir Percy Sykes, arrives with uh, some uh, colleagues and successfully manages to form a levy of local soldiers that would become a very efficient uh, military force in the hands of Britain, dealing with the pro-German elements in the south of the country, basically also bringing to an end all of these aspirations linked to this so-called German moment. And that force, of course, is the South Persia Rifles, or the SPR, which then sees basically the country ushering into 1916 into a, a, a period where it would now seem that it would go the other way around. While there was a German moment in 1915, there seems to be now an Entente moment in 1916, where the two Entente powers, Russia and Britain, have obviously to decide how they deal with it, 
where there is also a sort of further hardening of the idea that Persia might be one day divided up by, between these two powers because A, you now have the equivalent of the Cossack Brigade, which is Russian officer and had been always an instrument of Russian influence in the country, is now being mirrored by a British military group in the south, namely the SPR. There is also, unbeknown to the public opinion at the time and also unbeknown to the Iranian politicians at the time, a movement at the level of geopolitics, namely an understanding is being reached between the great powers of the Entente over their war aims in the region. And the most famous of these considerations and agreements and understandings is of course the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916. But prior to that, in a way, the uh, agreement that starts the ball, as it were, is an agreement reached in the spring of 1915 already between Russia and Britain and then also between France and Russia, which has collectively become known as the Constantinople Agreement or Straits Agreement, which is chiefly concerned with uh, Russia's claim, which is one of their major war aims, of course, of control of the Dardanelles and access to the Mediterranean and overlordship over Istanbul which has obviously special uh, uh, prescriptions attached to it, but the Russians want a clear, direct, controlled access to the warm waters of the Mediterranean passing through uh, the Straits. But one element of it is also that Britain and Russia now, as it were, make a modification to the 1907 uh, convention. They decide that they will do away with the zone in the middle, the neutral zone, and they divide the country into two zones, a Russian zone and a British zone. If you look at what has been agreed, and this is basically, uh, or if it would have been implemented, would have opened the door to a complete division of Iran between these two great powers, even though we, they are still speaking of zones of influence. But uh, it would not have been impossible that uh, if it had gone that way, that Russia might have decided to actually annex or to create a separate entity with a, with a puppet. But there would have been a strong sort of hypothesis that Iran or North Iran, as it were, would have gone the way of the Khaynate of Khiva which had been absorbed into the Ekokant, excuse me, which had been absorbed uh, uh, into the uh, uh, Russian Empire, or of the Khaynate of Riva and the uh, uh, Emirate of Bukhara becoming vassals without any meaningful sovereignty. So this is uh, being decided, and now 1916 seems like the moment this could be implemented. Britain moves and declares, reaches a, a negotiation with the, with the government. They put into place also governments that are now considered to be more friendly to them. Initially, Farman, Farman, and then there is the Sepah Solor. There is a, an agreement being put into place, which Britain believes in any case be sort of the pinnacle of that sort of stabilization. And the Russians are forced to accept it, thinking that in any case, you know, given the Constantinople agreement, they would have a, a, you know, a massive say about what would be going on in the north. The only thing is, when that agreement, which basically gives Britain quite a strong preponderance in a sort of further development of Iran, uh, becomes known, all hell plagues loose in Tehran, even though all the nationalists are no longer there. And in actual fact, the Shah sees this as, a potent, as, as, as an opportunity to throw a spanner in the works and dismiss the government of the Sepah Solar. A new government is being named under Mirza Hassan Khan Vusukodole, who basically pretends that it can't find any trace of that agreement that the Sepah Solar had presumably signed. But since the agreement uh, also stipulated the payment of port uh, of the, the Iranian state apparatus, you know, even though these were technically loans, the money is being taken. And this allows the government of Wusuk also a certain degree of further stabilization, which is in any case only very limited, because in the meantime, 
the Ottomans have been able to launch a new offensive and they take control of a whole pocket of territory in western Iran where it, they bring back all the leaders of the anti-entente forces that had fled in panic Tehran in the November 1915 plus a few people that come in from Berlin where uh, the group uh, around uh, Sayed Hassan Tari Sadeh had been active and forms even a counter-government in Kerman Shah. A counter-government uh, which argues that the government in Tehran is unable to function independently. The Shah whom they recognize is a prisoner to all intents and purposes. So the legitimate government of His Majesty the Shah is in actual fact here in Kerman Shah. A government which is headed by this politician that uh, the um, German military attaché had found, uh, Nesamo Saltane, and which sees, has amongst its members uh, distinguished figures like uh, a, a cleric that is thinking about political Islam at that early stage, namely uh, Modares. There is, however, an interesting feature in that cabinet. Uh, the minister of war is Salah al who is the son of the very Farman Farman that had been the first uh, prime minister after the exodus of 1915. And I always look at this thinking, this is an actual fact, the embodiment of a situation which applies to Iran in the First World War at a meta level. Namely, that Iran, you know, for all its sufferings, uh, and they will become greater as we move on in time, and its helplessness, and being an actual fact, as we see, even they don't know this at that time, being divided up into two zones. All of this, despite all of this, it, it, the war has a potential, as long as it's not clear how it is going. And as long as it is not clear how it is going, it is important not to sort of, as a whole of, uh, of, the, of the country, to nail one's colors to one particular mast. One, shouldn't, one should keep all the options open. And so in no way is this better embodied in this situation. You have a government in Tehran headed uh, or supported by a magnet that is clearly considered to be pro-British, namely Farman Farman, and you have his son who has, has seen military education being the minister of war of a counter-government, which is collaborating with the Ottoman Empire and the central powers, including Germany, even though the Germans have now clearly lost mastery of the movement. The people who call the shots in that Kerman Shah episode are the Ottomans. The Ottoman military, Ottoman secret services. And uh, the Germans play second fiddle but are still good enough to bankroll the whole affair of course. So in that context now everything is again open and the idea that the British were able to bring about a true and lasting order as at some point uh, I think Curzon is, is hoping he would be, for the time being, is not on the cards. The British s suffer several setbacks in the uh, war with the Ottomans. The whole uh, Mesopotamian campaign ends in disaster after the Battle of Kut. A whole Gallipoli adventure ends in uh, a defeat in a debacle for the, uh, for the Allied forces. So it is, uh, it's still, jury as it were, is still uh, open, but then uh, the Russians mount a powerful counter-offensive and once again all of these people have to uh, flee Iran and, and retreat towards Baghdad and then finally Istanbul or Berlin. And uh, by the beginning of the year 1917 it might look as if now the Entente powers would finally be able to implement a solution for Iran according to their plans. But then another geopolitical rupture occurs, the uh, revolution in Russia. First the so-called February Revolution in March 1917, then the revolution, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution in uh, the so-called October Revolution in November 1917. 
And this second revolution in particular reverberates strongly in Iran and impacts on the Iranian situation uh, of the First World War. Another uh, event happens in that time which uh, will become significant a little bit later and that's the entry into the First World War of the United States in April 1917, which brings another player into the equation and uh, brings into the equation a particular US president taking an interest in world affairs with a particular vision and a particular interest, which will be of importance uh, later on. But what is uh, happening on the ground is that the various Iranian governments are trying to sort of live with the situation and stabilize as much as they can, but there is basically complete anarchy and the, uh, the presence of foreign troops on the grounds begins to be also a, a, a drain on the ability uh, of feeding the Iranian population because, as it is well known, if armies march on their stomach and the presence of these foreign units on the grounds uh, can in uh, uh, unfortunate conditions very much upset the balance, especially if there is bad harvests due to weather conditions or locust invasions and so on, when there are uh, infrastructural problems where you can't bring supplies from one place to another, where you don't have quick access to, to imported supplies which might take out so in some sort of the sting of a shortage temporarily. If these things are not possible, then there can be very quickly problems with the supply in foodstuffs. And that begins to be a problem as we move to the end of the year 1917. As much as there is interesting developments going on, because the Bolshevik government, one of the first things it does, it is to bring to an end the participation in the war of uh, the Russian Empire. And uh, it also addresses very quickly in early 1918 passionate appeal to the toiling Muslims of the Orient, uh, asking them to rise up against their local oppressors and against British imperialists. These things are being heard in Iran on a political diplomatic level, peace, first the armistice that Russia makes with the Ottoman Empire and then the peace it makes with the Ottoman Empire, the context of the Brest-Litovsk uh, agreements, means that the Russian troops are leaving uh, Iran and uh, the uh, forces that remain behind are basically white Russians that are not willing to accept the government uh, that has become active in, in Petrograd and then later on Moscow because the Bolsheviks move the capital from Petrograd to Moscow at some point. Nevertheless, that seems to open up a window of opportunity. Emboldened by this, the government of uh, Samsamo Saitane immediately declares to all and sundry that it considers the Anglo-Russian convention null and void and will not submit itself to it, which obviously enrages the British, enrages the representatives of the white Russians, the anti-revolutionary you know, forces that have set up their own sort of network of diplomacy and uh, they are operating out of different areas of resistance uh, against the Bolsheviks. But it's one of these many elements where you see that the Iranian decision makers of the time, but at a, at a label you might want to stick at them, pro-British, pro-German, pro-this, pro-that, what they in the end of the day are pursuing is a policy of trying to find a wriggle room, a policy of trying to enhance Iran's position uh, as a result of this big conflagration as much as it is possible. This is one of these moves. The uh, challenges that come now or that the Ottomans appear on the horizon a third time in the summer of 1918, taking chunks of Iranian Azerbaijan, taking Tabriz, 
And in the context of this Ottoman invasion now occur some of the more traumatic scenes of the First World War in Iran. Because until now, as I said, I mean, there have been these various battles going on, but they have been to a degree removed from any impact on the civilian populations in a larger degree in any case. And what begins to be felt is the issue of the food supplies. But now in the context of the struggles in, 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 in 1918, there are in actual fact massacres to be witnessed in the area of Iranian Azerbaijan, in the conflict between Ottoman units, partially also irregular Ottoman units, units that had been set up with the help often of Russian, in one instance even uh, uh, French officers, made up from the Christian population of these areas that is either Armenian or uh, Assyro Chaldean. Their ranks having been further sort of enforced by Christians that had fled the genocidal uh, situation that had erupted in the Ottoman Empire in 1915 into Iran from eastern Anatolia, where they temporarily found shelter in an area controlled by the Russian army for most of the time and being tolerated by the Iranian government, which couldn't do anything in any case about their presence. Uh, amongst them, a recruitment had also occurred. And now move in without them being supported by the mighty Russian army anymore, or the Cossacks or whoever it was there before, uh, move in these irregular Ottoman units and slaughter ensues. And in the context of that slaughter, in and around also the town of Urumie, there are uh, massacres to be uh, deplored. F before that, there had also been rather rough treatment of Muslims on the part of these militias. Now the uh, moment of revenge seems to have come with the advent of the Ottoman units and the slaughter really of huge chunks of, of the population. So if you ask the question of victims and of what was going on, so this is one of these very dark points. Until then, all of the other things being hinted at might have had locally had this or that or the other impact, but were mainly, after all, fights between armed men even though sometimes fights between tribal units that were completely overpowered by a, a very disciplined and well-trained Russian army. Uh, here we have civilians being slaughtered and massacres taking place. So this is in a way the share that Iran has into, the, into this whole tragic saga of the Armenian genocide, even though it concerns uh, Armenians to a fewer degree, but other Christian uh, populations to a larger degree uh, in that area. And then uh, things become even more impactful uh, on the population of Iran as a whole beyond men of military age, and that is the impact which is a result, a direct result of the First World War and the presence of foreign troops the impact, the devastating impact of three separate vagues of the Spanish flu. You know, a, a phenomenon that hits the whole of the world at the time, which kills more than that have been killed in the battlefields uh, uh, altogether. It also doesn't spare Iran and it has been shown the impact of the flu follows the movement of the foreign troops being present in the country. And that is then compounded and, and sort of intertwined with famine that begins to hit from 1917 onward, which is a result of, again, the drain on resources in terms of foodstuff as a result of the presence of uh, uh, foreign troops combined with a whole range of other measures as bad harvests, transport problems, speculation, hoarding, interdiction of imports implemented by even British troops, which decimates the population further. And that is where the real tragedy in a way of the First World War hits Iran, and where suffering becomes far more widespread than it had been before, if we 
take into account, of course, that given the whole situation, of course, Iran had been suffering at the eve of the First World War from a situation of its nation building processes stalling and uh, it's suffering from foreign uh, uh, economic and political penetration. But now it is a concrete suffering and uh, the figures that have been advanced are difficult to, to prove. And there is this idea of 10 million Iranians having perished in that, that had been put forward by Majd, uh, who seems to me uh, somebody who is going after sensationalist claims for whatever reasons. And uh, there have been very serious reviews of his thesis, which have called into question uh, these figures. What is true is that this tragedy happened and cries out for more research and cries out to be uh, uh, addressed by historians who are not beholden to the idea of uh, creating sensations or trying to score points in a sort of ideological or political struggle. And we will have to, we will probably f learn more and maybe at some point be able to gauge the scale of uh, the deaths that occurred at the moment of the combined impact of the Spanish flu and the famine situation. But for the time being, we can only note that this is, the, uh, that this is on the balance sheet of this First World War. And the interesting aspect of all of this is, is that these more, uh, if you like, bitter and brutal experiences that Iran has in this world, First World War occur toward the end of the war, where there is actually at the diplomatic level, an interesting window of opportunity that opens up. Uh, because as we come to the end of the First World War and it becoming clear that the Entente is winning, and even though there is this summer offensive of the Ottomans and there is one final offensive that the Germans mount in the spring of 19 at the Western Front, by the autumn, it's clear there is a winner here. And the Ottoman Empire is in actual fact the first to sign an armistice, uh, the armistice of Mudros on the 30th of October uh, 1918. We are now from a geopolitical uh, point of view at an interesting situation that presents itself to Iranian foreign policymakers. Despite all the weakness and the suffering, uh, and that is that a major challenger to Iranian sovereignty and territorial integrity seems to have been removed from the equation, namely Russia. Because there is a civil war going on and uh, the regime that had signed all of these agreements with the British about dividing up is no longer in power, even though it might come back into power because it's a civil war going on. The Ottoman Empire, which had always been a problematic neighbor, is defeated. But on the other hand, you have Britain being in place, seemingly controlling the situation alone. In and of itself, it could seem, okay, now we find, we, we face this mighty power on its own without even having the possibility to play off uh, the British against the Russians or against the Germans who are also defeated. But, and that's why I mentioned the entry of the United States into the First World War, at that level of international politics, there is now another momentum uh, that has been going on, and that is the United States President Woodrow Wilson and the discourse about uh, the right of uh, self-determination that comes out of Washington and the famous 14 points that had been declared in January 1918, which uh, is something that countries like Iran or populations like Iran or all over the world are noticing and are trying to exploit. In addition to this, this big conflagration, this great war, 
will culminate in a peace conference. This is also clear now. And the peace conference will, so it seems, be very much dominated by this new power on the bloc, the United States, with this outlook that is an anti-imperialist, anti-colonial outlook. And this provides, of course, a, a potential counterpoint to the mighty presence of one single power now left that Iran has to contend with, which is Britain, which has occupied large chunks of Iranian territory now as a result of these developments, both in the south with the help of the South Persia rifles, but also in the east, where they had also raised levies to create what became known as the East Persia Cordon in an attempt to make sure that no further German agents would find their way into Central Asia, and where the Mollison mission is being created that makes its way uh, uh, into Central Asia to, via Ashgabat from uh, Khorasan. And of course there's North Persia Force, which holds large chunks of Northwest Persia. It, um, is also the scene where we had this very interesting military adventure, which is the Dunster Force under Major General Dunsterville, that comes from Mesopotamia through Iran, uh, appears in Baku, uh, but then has to withdraw and comes back into Iran. While in Iran itself, of course, stability has not ensued. There are various centers of upheaval uh, and the central government, which I say has now before it nevertheless this geo strategic panorama is a government that can at the regional and local level not do much more than be present in Tehran. There is a rebellion brewing in Gilan and uh, north of you know on, on the shores of the Caspian Sea, the, the southern shores of the Caspian Sea, which had been linked to support from the Germans and the Ottomans but is completely autonomous, under a charismatic leader, a veteran of the con constitutional struggle, Mirza Kuchek Khan. There are uh, movements in place in, in, in Tabriz and its surroundings by other veterans of constitutional uh, era, making all manner of claims uh, that challenge the central government. A local potentate in the southwest of Iran who had thrown his lot in with the British in the conflagration, namely the Sheikh of Mohammare, Ras Al, is increasingly behaving in his area around Mohammare, what is nowadays of course known as Khoram Shah, if he was the leader of an independent country. So the country is far from being under the control of the central government and Obviously nothing of that nation-building agenda that the constitutionalists objectively had, not that they had a document where this was written on. I, I, I say this as a, as a sort of an observation of what objectively was in front of them. None of this agenda had been made any progress, of course, in that period. But Iran is still there. And now, of course, the challenge at the diplomatic level, at the international level, is we need to seize this opportunity. And the reports that are coming in from the Iranian representatives that have been kept going, after all, in London, in Paris, in Washington, are all unisono saying the same thing. We need to get into that peace conference. We need to make our claims heard. This is where a new world order will be drawn up and we have to be there. And this is what the government that is in place now is beginning to work upon. And this government finds itself once again in uh, the hands of uh, Mirza Hassan Khan, Busu Kodole, who came to office in August of 1918, once again, clearly uh, by presenting himself to the British as somebody that they could do business with and that would be good for them. And the British, believing that Wusuk might be their man, are also uh, leaning heavily on Ahmad Shah, the monarch, by saying, if you keep that man in office, we will pay you a handsome monthly allowance. And so uh, it is done. Does this mean that this politician is a creature of the British, docilely doing what his British paymasters tell him? No. It is one thing 
to go uh, and present oneself in a particular manner to gain office in a situation where the British call the shots in any case. It is another thing to pursue a policy aiming to increase the room for maneuver for Iran and to benefit from that newly existing geopolitical situation in order to secure once and for all Iran's status as an independent, internationally recognized sovereign state beyond any doubt and beyond any attempt to implement something like the Constantinople Agreement, which is of course now a dead letter because Russia has pulled out, or something like the Anglo Russian Convention of 1907 and to ensure also the territorial integrity of Iran and in the best case perhaps even making some gains. This latter two points become the main aim of the diplomatic activity of the government of uh, Mirza Hassan Khan Boussoukodole from him taking office in the August of 1918 and it is embodied immediately at the moment that the uh, war is not yet even over, whereby the uh, Iranian, uh, while well, the armistice is declared, uh, the Iranian government sends hit their shopping list to the winners of the First World War, requesting access to the peace conference and telling them we want this, this, this and the other, which mainly includes some sort of formal recognition of independence, which includes reparations for the war damages that had been suffered, uh, which includes a revision of the uh, commercial treaties in place, which are, have been rather unfavorable in terms of giving tariff advances and advantages to uh, especially the British. Also, the opportunity to potentially pursue some territorial adjustments to the Iranian borders by gaining back territories that had been lost in the course of the 19th century. That sort of shopping list is immediately given as soon as the armistice is signed on the 11th of November. And the government is not sitting on his hand. The Iranian government had already in 1917 the foresight of realizing that there will be one day a reckoning and there will be one day a peace conference and therefore they created something that became known as the Commission Tayine Chesorot whereby they wanted to provide a halfway respectable repository of all the damages that Iran had suffered as a result of this war. And they create subcommittees of that commission in every provincial capital. They even print questionnaires that people have to fill in so that they can go to the international community and say, look, we have, based on actual empirical activity, a balance sheet of what we have been suffering and that's why we are demanding reparations. So this activity is being wrapped up and a final report is being established. Wusuk creates a special commission to define the Iranian, which is now no longer of course a war, therefore I gave it the name Peace Aims, where by under the leadership of one of the most well-educated minds and also politicians and diplomats of the time, namely Zoko Oemolk uh, Foruri, a interministerial commission is being formed to, def to define what Iran might want to ask for if they ever get access to the peace conference. This commission is coming up with a lengthy uh, report of recommendations by the end of 1918. It is based on the commission's report, which has a maximal and minimal uh, and medium requests, uh, that uh, based on this, that the Iranians form a delegation that is going to be sent to the peace conference. And this happens in the autumn of 1918, while uh, the uh, allied governments, especially Britain and France, keep telling the Iranians to forget about it and 
telling them you have no business being there, you are neutral, your neutrality hasn't been particularly friendly. There will be other questions uh, that are going to be settled. Please do not come. The government of Mirza Hassan Khan and Vusuko Dole ignores uh, this refusal and stubbornly puts together a delegation uh, which is finally leaving Iran in December 1918 under the uh, leadership of the foreign minister, Moshevaro Mamolek. Moshevaro Mamolek takes with him also as the brain, if you like, of the delegation, uh, Forouki, who goes along. There is a French legal advisor and then there are a few other diplomats as well. And they uh, make their way to the peace conference. And they arrive in Paris in, uh, just in time when the peace conference has started. Initially also the belief was that this might happen in the United States. And, so, and it is interesting that if you look at the, com at, at, at the documents, there is a lot of preparatory work being done with the Iranian embassy here in Paris where, they, where they, there's correspondence about how we finance this, where do, they, where do we put the delegation. Because what happens now is there is a sort of cluster of Iranians that gets active in Paris. In Paris where since uh, late January the leaders of the world have been gathering and a massive conference, a congress, is taking place. All the big heads are there. Uh, Wilson, Clemenceau, of course, who hosts the conference, the French Prime Minister, Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, the Italian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, the Japanese Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, and of course, assorted other countries that had a stake in the First World War. And here the Iranians begin to work to make themselves heard based on the instructions they receive from Tehran, which are crystal clear. Vusuk tells them, make a maximum positive atmosphere in the public opinion. And then he gives them the green light to actually put the demands to, to the official uh, representatives of the peace conference. And that cluster is the delegation, with Moshe Val as the leader of the delegation, and uh, their brain, the very cultivated Fururi. There is also the Iranian ambassador, or in, that, in those, those times, minister in Paris, who is Momtazu Saltane, Samatron, Mirza Samatron, Momtazu Saltane, who knows everybody in Paris. He's been there for donkey's years. He has deputies, journalists, politicians. He knows them all he brings them into contact with the delegation. And then there is also a specialist for the United States that comes, namely a diplomat that had been at the Iranian legation in Washington, Nabil Odole, who had been the chargé d'affaires, for a while there is no minister in, in Washington, later then there is one, but Nabil Odole comes with the President Wilson and, the, and Colonel House and the American delegation to Paris and puts his knowledge of American politics and his connections with especially uh, the Secretary of State Robert Lansing into the service of the delegation. And they begin to work. They meet with President Wilson. They meet with the Italian delegation. They start a press campaign. The uh, most important French newspaper, Le Temps, begins to get interested in the Iranian case. It's actually the Italians that put it on the council meeting of the peace conference and say these Iranians have to be heard for the first time in February 1919. And they make, as Fourouri put it, a lot of Saro Sedar. But that Saro Sedar is not something that they do against the will of the prime minister in Tehran. They, he clearly himself sends an instruction saying, go full throttle. But interestingly enough, while he tells his delegation to do that, he enters into secret talks with the British embassy or British legation in Tehran, uh, headed by an old hand 
of Indian uh, affairs and also Arab affairs, Sir Percy Cox. What they discuss is a sort of a rehash of that surpassal law agreement that I had mentioned. An exclusive agreement with Britain, whereby Britain would be the country that would help Iran to basically now get on with that business of nation building, which I had been uh, talking about, which was the agenda of the constitutionalists. A, a strong central government, get the army versus the uh, name, a financial uh, institutions into place uh, and, and, and revenue into the coffers of the state, build the infrastructure, ideally railways. All of that is, of course, the agenda. That agenda is also behind the activities of the delegation in Paris that tries to secure an entry into the conference where the Iranians could put forward their claims. And it is now being also put onto the table by Vusuk in Tehran saying, this is what we want. Can you give us this? If you do so, we will be able to deal with you. We take money in the form of a loan. We will do our railway building uh, mainly with your companies. You will be our financial advisors. You will be our military advisors. But what is interesting is, uh, from, uh, if one studies this move, what he is doing basically is to pursue a, a policy where there is a program, an aim. And he is, batching, he is hedging his bets basically. If it works at the peace conference, so much for the better. But if it doesn't work, then there would be at least uh, something that one could get out from the British acknowledging that they are the only uh, show in town, as it were, at the time. They are the only power that is there at the time and one would have to get on with them. And what he quite skillfully does now in the pro uh, period of this basically early spring to the middle of the spring of 1919 is to haunt the British by the specter of a success in Paris into giving him concessions. And this is clear when one, when one studies, and Olsen has done it in its brilliant books on uh, Anglo-Iranian relations, the, the genesis of the Anglo-Persian agreement of 1919. They always up the ante, the, Brit the Iranians want this, this and the other, and the British know that obviously they have to be quick if they want to forestall the success of the delegation. And finally, the delegation's course is taken up by President Wilson himself, who puts it to the uh, negotiating table. And at that moment in time, the British have to basically pull the plug. The, the British delegation is, you know, which is sort of piloted from behind the scenes through Curzon, who stays behind in London, is forced to put their cards on the table and tell the Americans, listen, leave this whole Persian business to us. What are you constantly bringing the idea up that they should be heard at the peace conference? They have no business being here. So they have to basically put their cards on the table. And this is the result of a very skillful foreign policy that is being pursued with having these two irons in the fire at the same time, which finally uh, hits a problem because the peace conference is never actually getting to deal with Middle Eastern questions for a variety of reasons that we won't now go into detail uh, about. And then the Treaty of Versailles is signed on the 28th of June 1919 and the American president leaves France never to come back. But the balance sheet is not so bad because the Saro Sedar that the Iranians have made at that time means that they are written into that treaty by being written into the creation of an international body of states, namely the League of Nations. That League of Nations treaty, the, or the covenant for the creation of a uh, League of Nations, is being enshrined with the June uh, Treaty of Versailles at the smallest the same time. And Iran becomes a member of that, which is of course a major achievement because it is another indicator of the fact that Iran is not something that will be divided up by some people, will not some, some sort of colony. It's a, an internationally recognized state. And so this is already a, a partial success of that policy. But of course, now 
when there is no longer the conference sitting for a period of time and nobody knows when they will reconvene. With President Wilson no longer being there, although everybody believes he would come back, which he never does, Wusuk has to consider his options. So he makes one last ditched attempt in June 1919 to get the other powers involved. He actually goes to the French minister and puts his cards on the table. And so does his Minister of Justice, the young French-trained lawyer and expert in international relations history, Firouz Mirza Firouz Nosrato Dole, another son of the already mentioned Farmer Farmer. And they go to the French minister and say, listen, we, are, you know, we have been trying to get into this conference. Wusuk had behind the scenes also used the journalists to try and get a direct line to Clemenceau. But the French were deaf on that ear. They didn't want to hear. And that brings the two of them to go to uh, Bonin, who was at that time the French minister, and say, listen, if you don't help us, if you do not yourself get involved and also drag the Americans into the scene, uh, we will be obliged to sign with the British. Brunon sends the information to Paris and says, we better stay out of this. They are trying to play up uh, one against the other. The French remain deaf on their ear. And only after he has made this final last ditch attempt to get that sort of multi-power thing going, Wusuk decides to, rather than having nothing, to get a treaty going with the British and I think farewell knowing that it would not be necessarily something that would stand in all eternity, but is something that gets going. The money issue, of course, is being often pointed at, namely that bribes have been paid. This is not Wusuk who brings that up. They, there are two politicians involved in this. One I already mentioned, Firas Musaf, Firuz Nasato Dole. The other one is Soremo Dole, the, fist, the son of Zelo Sultan, who is the Minister of Finance at the time. These are the only people that know about these secret negotiations. And it is the two of them who say, well, you know, we could also do with some recognition financially. Sorem says, you know, given that there is a loan in being negotiated here, two million pounds sterling, we can do one thing, we can get these payments as an advance on that loan. And when the loan repayment is due, we can sort of make some trickery with the exchange rate so that this will basically evaporate. And so, in actual fact, yes, they negotiate that as a, as a basically advance on the loan, money is being paid with the idea that they would bribe politicians and so on. 100,000 each for the two and 200,000 for Vusuko Dole. Vusuko Dole never touches that money. He puts it into Tom Anyan's transport business in uh, the Lake Urmia area, knowing that he might uh, have to give that back. And, and in any case, it's neither here nor there because he pursues a policy completely independently of that money. This money is not what induces him to do what he does, as I think have shown now. And he goes to the French first and tries to get a deal. He then tries to get in touch with Clemenceau. It doesn't work. The delegation in Paris is not successful because Wilson is gone, even though they managed to get you on, and this is no small uh, achievement, into the league. And now it, the Russian situation is also on the cusp or seems to be on the cusp of changing because the white Russian anti-revolutionary forces seem to be on the verge of taking Moscow. The volunteer army of General Denikin is 50 kilometers from Moscow in the summer of 1919. God help the Iranians when the old regime is being back. So having something in place, however sort of uh, unsatisfactory and non multi power base that would allow, through the help of a loan, through the help of infrastructure development, to finally get going with this nation building agenda is better than nothing. Not least since the British are also uh, happy to sign an additional exchange of letters whereby in a secret addendum to the agreement, they declare themselves willing to support Iranian claims for reparations, 
for changes of their boundaries to make some territorial gains and to revise the unfavorable tariff agreements that are being in place, that are still being in place at that time. So there is hope that they have now an ally when the peace conference will resume. Because the mistake that many people make is that they think the peace conference is over with the Treaty of Versailles, the peace treaty with Germany. But it's not the case. It continues. There's quite a few more pieces to be signed in any case with the Bulgarians, with the uh, Austro-Hungarian, with Austria, with Hungary, because they are now separate, and with the Ottoman Empire. In that context, the Iranians hope that they might now being able to push for some of these territorial gains, get back some of the Caucasus, get Soleimani, the Sanjak of Soleimani, and other uh, ideas. And so they sign on the 9th of August 1919, a treaty which became then known as the Anglo-Persian Agreement. And when this becomes knowledge, the French press gets into overdrive. The French diplomacy gets into overdrive. The same people who didn't want to listen in June when Wusuk put the cards on the table, they say now, what have they done? Part and parcel of this campaign is linked to Moshe Vama Molek and the good connections that Momtazu Saltaneh has in Paris because they know journalists and they immediately denounce it because part and parcel of the 1919 agreement is a reshuffle of the cabinet and Moshe Vamolek loses his job as foreign minister which is given to Firuz. So there's a press campaign. The reality, and this is what people don't understand, is that most of that French press campaign, diplomatic campaign against the agreement and the idea that Britain has now established a protectorate over Iran, and that Iran has foregone its independence, is linked to another issue. It's linked to French claims to get at least certain aspects of the Sykes-Picot agreement implemented, namely to get their hands on Syria and the Lebanon, something that the British are obstructing, arguing that since the defeat of the Ottoman Empire was brought about mainly by British weapons, while the French contribution was limited, there is no need now to go ahead with these stipulations and there is no uh, need to stick with the idea that there would be a big zone of influence for the French in Syria and the Lebanon and that the French would get more or less direct control of coastal areas, as it was foreseen in the uh, Sykes-Picot agreement. And this enrages French diplomacy at that moment in time. They are in a protracted struggle with Britain over the French claims in the Levant. That explains the campaign, not so much a, an interest in Iran, but it is true that the perfect connections of uh, Samad Khan and Moshe Vamolek and Fururi help to stoke the fire. The Americans also get into overdrive. And at that moment in time, of course, uh, Wusuk says, well, we told you so. He goes and sees Bonin and says, well, I mean, we warned you. But an interesting comment is being made by uh, Wusuk when he sees the French minister. He says, go on, make more noise. Bring the whole thing down, and then we can renegotiate. In other words, Wusuk foresaw also the whole thing as a sort of a wake-up call. He's always on the lookout to make a better deal. But if he can't have it, he tries to make that stick. He then also tells Firuz and the Shah making their way to Europe, because Firuz is now being the representative at the peace conference. And Firuz comes and sees what's going on in Paris with this whole campaign. But he says to Wusuk, listen, we need to use this to get more concessions from the British. They will not be happy about it. And let's milk it at least. If he can't bring it down altogether, then let's milk it. And it's interesting, Firuz does not go straight to London as one, as one might expect, or as his reputation is as a you know, politician busy selling the country to the British. He goes to Paris first, against the will of Lord Curzon. Curzon is, is red with rage that Firuz does not go straight to London, 
but actually travels to Paris first, where he takes the waters, where he talks to his PhD supervisor. Firuz defended his PhD at the Sorbonne in the summer of 1914, in international relations, basically. Even it's called international law, but, you know, it's, it's IR history in actual fact. He wrote a thesis on the, uh, which, is, which has been published on the question of Muscat. And he gets advice. And he comes away with the clear instruction. So there's this idea, which also Cartesian has perpetuating, that, was, that Firuz is crestfallen when he is in Paris because there's so much hostility against this wonderful agreement. No, he is lucid. He is completely aware of what's going on. And he says, let's use this campaign to extract concessions from the British. And only once he has been in Paris and has made these assessments and has re-established his contacts, he goes across the channel and meets Curzon. And then Curzon sees the need to throw a big banquet. And one of the concessions straight away that Curzon is giving there, even though it might not be seen as such a big deal, he declares the Anglo-Russian convention null and void on the 18th of September 1919 at a huge banquet at the Guildhall that he throws in favor of Firuz. And this, of course, enrages the Russians, not the Bolsheviks, who don't care, but the white Russian representatives who protest against this. But, you know, it might seem now, because we know what happened later, as a sort of non-event, but in the day it was an achievement. And then Virus says, you know, listen, you need to be, we need to be seen and give us more. You need to make big gestures so that we can sell the agreement at home, now that it has, that it has come under so much flack. In Tehran, the same song is being sung. The Prime Minister sends one of his trusted allies, Seyed Ziya Uddin Tabotabai, who is uh, editing a newspaper at the time, who gets an interview with the British minister, and he basically puts a shopping list. Will you give us this? Will you give us this? What will you do to support us there? So there is a concerted effort to, because the British are shaken with this response. Curzon is furious. He contacts the Americans and said, I told you so, we, you know, we, we have been telling you so. And why are you now making all of that fuss about it? The French, well, they know why they are angry. You know, they have this problem with Syria and they make some concessions in actual fact. And interestingly enough, by the, the end of December, September, when the concessions have been made, the French interest in the Iran situation dies down because they got what they want. That has never anything to do with Iran in and of itself. And at that moment in time, Firuz in London hopes that, you know, we might really get some hefty chunks of territory. He puts forward various schemes and uh, maps are being submitted and it initially looks good. Then Ahmad Shah makes a state visit in London in early November 1919, which also seems to be like a success, even though there is this saga that pressure had been put on the Shah not to denounce the agreement and so on, which is in any case something that the Shah, I think, had been spreading to sort of carry favor with, with uh, the nationalists. Only towards the end of the year 1919 it becomes clear that the British have a totally different vision over uh, what they want to support the Iranians with. Wusuk uh, is completely disillusioned by that time and is, uh, is clearly considering the, the agreement that letter, uh, which is what people do not understand. That doesn't mean that one can't take an advisor, that one can't take a loan, but it doesn't mean that he's in any form or shape beholden to the British. And he moves quickly out of the shadow of the British from the new year onward. Especially because it becomes clear that the British, not only are they not supporting the Iranians at the peace conference that has reopened, they don't want to support even minor territorial claims. He opens, not only that, they are also not able to support, it would appear, Iran with weapons and money and soldiers against the new threat that is arising in the meantime, namely that the tide has once again turned in the civil war and it is now the Bolsheviks that have been winning and they are driving south the remainder of the voluntary army of General Denikin and they might at some point arrive on the borders of Iran. Already there is unclear situation in Gilan there are uh, Bolshevik agents active in Khorasan. Where will that end? Uh, the British 
uh, even though Curzon might have wanted to, given that they are helplessly overstretched on a military point of view and also have a war-tired population, are not able to defend. And it is clear that they will not go and defend the Caucasian territories if a push comes to shock. So what Vusuk tries is then to get something under his own steam. So he sends Sayed Sia to Baku, given also that Firuz had been dealing with the Azerbaijani delegation in Paris and had cooked up a big scheme where one could sort of get British help to get somehow Iran into a position of a, a tutor of the Azerbaijan. And this goes as far as the signing of a protocol for a confederation between Iran and Azerbaijan. So they would be moving with the foreign policy of this confederation being uh, dealt with by Iran. And this is signed by the delegation in Paris, but it is not clear to what degree that delegation is really having the full credentials of the government in Baku. So the Vusuk sends the Sayed over there and they begin to negotiate in Baku to, to reach an agreement as long as especially the idea is still in the minds of the fearful Azerbaijanis who look at the Bolsheviks coming, that Iran has somehow, is somehow in good standing or has a special relationship with the British. In the end of the day, uh, there is an agreement signed, the treaty signed uh, by middle of March 1920, uh, Nowruz in actual fact of the new year, 20th of March. But by that time it's clear that the Bolsheviks will be uh, in town before too long. And so it doesn't come to anything, but it just shows the, the range of foreign policy that is being led by somebody who is supposedly just sitting there doing what the British tell them. That's not the case. He is in actual fact at that moment in time also realizing that the British will not help him against the Bolsheviks. So he reshuffles his government, out goes Soramo Dole, who seems to be too pro-British. And he then takes up secretly contact with the Bolshevik government saying we are, we are happy to deal with you after bef this was not possible before and we will want to sign an agreement with you. We want to sign a treaty with you. This is March 1920. You know, there is indeed an agreement being signed more or less a year later, the famous Soviet-Iranian treaty of the 26th of February 1921. But the father of that treaty is not Reza Shah, who has nothing to do with it is not Sepah, Dar, is not Zeyed Ziyan, it's Vusuk. When the British learn about this initiative, they are raging with, uh, with anger. Firuz is being dressed down by Curzon in London. How dare you, you know, talking to the Bolsheviks. Have I not given you this wonderful treaty? Have I not, you know, Firuz is totally unimpressed and says we need to look after our own, especially since you are not able to defend us against the Bolsheviks. The idea of a treaty is born. And it looks as if that is going somewhere when there is a further twist in the story. Namely, the Bolsheviks now, by the end of April, they take over Azerbaijan. They do not stop there, as had to be feared, and they land in Anzali on the 18th of May 1920. Uh, there is a Soviet force landing in Anzali under the command of the uh, Red Admiral Raskolnikov, and they are now moving south, defeating the uh, forces that are there to defend, or rather forcing them to flee. The British withdraw behind the Manjil Pass and Gilan is open. And the Bolsheviks sort of catch up with the already still ongoing uh, Mirza Kutche Khan movement and the Jangal movement to finally declare the creation of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Iran in Russia in June 1920, early June 1920. Now the Iranians have a problem. They have their territorial integrity being violated by the Bolsheviks and who is there to help them. Now, Vusuk speaks to the British. Curzon tells him not to worry, this will somehow go away as it were by itself. Then Vusuk instructs his foreign minister, who is still in Europe, Firuz, to take the matter to the League of Nations. Well, 
what is it for? Why are we a member if not to, you know, get some help in such a situation? One could argue. But there is another dimension to this. This membership of the League of Nations had been always contested by in the, in the interim. Especially the French were saying, how can Iran be a member of the League of Nations? It's a British protectorate. Protectorates have no business being in the League of Nations. So the uh, Iranians uh, see this as an opportunity, and it's clear from the exchanges between Wusuk and Firuz, they clearly see this as an opportunity to test the waters and to see to what degree this is actually meaningful. And ideally to, of course, to cement their membership in that League of Nations. The French tell when this is being first approached by Wusuk to tell, get lost, you have no business being there. You should not seize the League of Nations. Curzon tells the same thing, not saying that you shouldn't be there, but say, I will handle that, as it were. Do not, under no circumstances, demand anything from the League of Nations. What does Wusuk do? He takes it to the League. And the first session is presided over by Curzon on the 14th of June 1920. He tries every trick in the book to ridiculize the Iranians, to throw them out on procedural reasons, to, to say they have no business being there. But Firuz stands his grounds. And he has lucky on that day because the usual French delegate to the League Council isn't there. And the person who is there is somebody who takes a strong dislike of Curzon. And this French representative actually sides in defying the instructions of his own government, which read, block the Persians. He supports Firuz. And so a motion is passed. Then there is another session on the 16th, whereby uh, the League condemns the Soviet invasion and asks the two people, uh, the two uh, powers, to uh, negotiate. Something which is possible because uh, by that time a Soviet negotiator, Leonid Krasin, has already arrived in London to conclude a, a trade agreement with Britain. But there is a follow up to this. There is a, some sort of, a, you know, we speak when Bar Jom is mentioned, you know, the GPOA, we speak of the snapback. You know, the famous, there's also a snapback, namely that if the Iranians do not come to any agreement with the Bolsheviks, they should bring back the matter to the League. And this is a League resolution. It's in actual fact the first resolution of the Council of the League regarding the complaint of a foreign country under Article 10 of the Statutes of the League of Nations. And that first country that brings a case is Iran. And it is Wusuko Dole as the Prime Minister who is responsible for that. And a resolution is, be, is voted unanimously with Iran. So you must also you know, consider this. Iran sits at the table and votes a motion with including its own voice. It's no longer the others deciding we divide you up, we do this, we make that. No, Iran sits at the table, is taking part in parcel of the vote. And after that, if anybody knows about it, which is not very well known in the literature, it's always ridiculized. You know, what, did the, what did the Iranians think? Did they think that they would now send some, some sort of blue helmets and to throw out the Russians? No. And it is clear when Firuz describes the events, he says, what is important in this initiative is that we sat at the table, that we got a motion accepted with our own vote, and everybody that now says we are not a member, we have no business being in the League of Nations, cannot do so because we have been part and parcel of procedure there as a member. And this was the reason why they were so obstinate against British and French blockage to push for that, not because they hoped that somehow the League, of which the Soviet Russia was not a member, would be able to impose anything on the Soviets. The negotiations are then being done directly with the Soviets, because even though Wusuk's government finally falls in a little bit later, uh, in later June 1920, after this major achievement in actual fact, because of differences with the Shah, which shows also that you know, the time of change, 
uh, if you want to do something like what you wanted to do as Wusuk, you need to have another power base than just the Shah, because the Shah is fickle. Yeah. So in this moment in time, the government of Wusuk falls, but the policy that he had given, namely to somehow find a way to stabilize Iran's position in a way that would be beyond any reproach and would be, if nothing else, at least territorial integrity and sovereignty recognized by an international body, is continuing under Moshe Rodole, who becomes his successor, under the Sepahdar, and it is Moshe Rodole that sets in motion the delegation, goes to Moscow, and surprise, surprise, who is heading it? Moshe Varoma Molek. Uh, they go to Moscow, they negotiate. In the meantime, another detail of Iranian history happens, namely the coup d'etat of Reza Khan on the 21st of February 1921, which is an actual fact, of course, not the coup d'etat of Reza Khan. It's a complete misnomer. It's the coup d'etat of Zayed Ziya, another of the key figures of what I have just talked about. But this is neither here nor there in my argumentation. What is important is that five days after that, coup, completely unbeknown to the government that has been formed in Tehran, Moshe Varma Molek signs a treaty with the Soviet Union, or with what is then Soviet Russia, so the Union doesn't exist yet, which recognizes Iran in a way that no Russian government had done for the last 100 years. And in parallel, Seyed Ziya, even though he tells the British it's just for consumption of the gallery, tears up the Anglo-Iranian agreement for whatever it was worth and declares it null and void. And Iran had been, thanks to the efforts of Firuz and Vusuk, been a member of the League beyond any reasonable doubt. So we arrive, as I see it, at the end of the First World War. Iran is in a situation where its status as a member of the international community, however it is weak it is, you know, there's no doubt about it, and however much the government in Tehran is basically the mayor of Tehran. At the international level, there is no doubt that this is a recognized, independent, sovereign state in certain borders which are now not to be violated, even though they're also not getting bigger. And there is no protectorate, there's no sort of domination, there is no Bolshevik plan that is being implemented, there is no Russian overlordship. And that is the outcome of the First World War at the geopolitical level. And that's why I argue, despite all the sufferings that we hinted at, and despite all the destruction and despite all the dead allies that, 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 that Iran went into and the complete sort of chaos which it ha is in by the time of the signature of this Soviet-Iranian treaty on the 26th of February. On the 26th of February 1921 ends the First World War and it ends in a situation where Iran against all odds, one could argue, if you follow what had been in store for it, is still there, has a territory. And if we spoke about the birth of the modern Iranian nation, you know, progress had been made towards a nation state. But it is now, one could argue, that territory is clearly defined, that the national consciousness has also arisen, that the actual building of that modern nation-state can now begin. And this then in actual fact takes place in a framework where at least one doesn't have to constantly look over one's shoulder over the existence of Iran as an international state, even though there's further international involvement and interference and there's further occupation in the Second World War. But, you know, these are specific circumstances. And it proceeds in a particular way, which is the way that it proceeds uh, under the reign of Reza Shah. But that's a different story. The First World War has brought about the conditions for this process to happen. And if nothing else, despite all the hardship, despite all the sufferings, but I, but despite having been, as you put it, uh, basically a failed state that 
was also considered to become a mandate, for instance, something that the British seriously considered. Despite all of these plans and despite all of these division ideas, Iran survived as a territorially intact sovereign international state and it did so not because it was lucky, even though there were certain factors that helped, obviously. It did so because of the active policies being pursued by a number of the elites of Iran, who, for whatever reason, managed to pursue that maneuvering course at which I hinted, with a successful outcome, at least at the meta level. However, great the hardships were and however great the sufferings were and however much Iran is utterly weak, devastated and chaotic in this February of 1921. But it is still there with his borders intact, with it being internationally recognized and therefore able to embark on becoming the modern nation state that it is then becoming in the years that follow. And that's, in a nutshell, <laughs> the story of the First World War. <laughs>